webinar is the eighth webinar in the, in the series. We do these webinars on Fridays at 1 p.m. Irish time. And we host experts from different fields in the global health to discuss every week a certain aspect of COVID-19 pandemic. So today's webinar is co-organized with the Development Studies Association of Ireland Humanitarian Action Study Group. DSAI is a network and a space for dialogue between Hello. development researchers and policymakers and practitioners. And it's a pleasure working on this webinar together with DSAI. Today's topic is leveraging research and evidence to support humanitarian response to COVID-19. A recording of this webinar and the previous webinars are available in our website later, uh, shown in the screen and also in our YouTube channels. Live streaming is also available now in our YouTube channel, Irish Global Health Network. If you have any questions during the webinar, you can use the questions and answer feature in the bottom of the screen, and we will try to answer them during the webinar. For now, I will leave you with my co-host Nadine Pierce France, the Executive Director of Irish Global Health Network, who will introduce the speakers and lead the discussion. Uh, Nadine? Wonderful. Thanks, Hala, and uh, welcome, everybody. Particularly delighted to be co-hosting this with uh, DSAI today. So we have some wonderful speakers. Uh, today we have Amy Folan. Very welcome. She's the Senior Education Advisor from Concern Worldwide. Welcome, Amy. We have Ben Heaven-Taylor. He's the Chief Executive Officer of Evidence Aid, sitting in the UK. Welcome, Ben. Uh, we have Gulwali Khan, who's joining us from Pakistan. He's the Chief Executive Officer of an NGO called Prepared, and he's also the national focal point in Pakistan for the Global Network of Civil Society Organizations for Disaster Reduction. So welcome, Gulwali Khan. Uh, we have Niall Roach, known to many. Uh, he's a lecturer and also on the, um, the IGHN board. Um, he's also an environmental health uh, officer by background, and many of you will know him from his teaching on the public health module of the Masters in Humanitarian Action in UCD. Um, and then, of course, we have um, our webinar anchor, our steady and constant, uh, Ruri Brua, the, uh, the former head of Department for Epidemiology and Public Health in the Royal College of Surgeons. So we're going to start by kicking off, as we normally do, with Ruri, and just ask you, Ruri, if you can just give us as, as quick as you can an update on the situation and where we're at. Thank you. Um, thanks, Nadine. So Ellen is just pulling up the slides there. So... Well, uh, today it's going to be a bit different. It's going to be mainly just a, a global overview, uh, a snapshot of the global epidemic, and then a focus on um, impacts on HIV, AIDS, TB and malaria. So Ellen's going to bring us into that link uh, at the bottom of the screen there. That's perfect. Um, so first at the top there, you see we're close to 4 million ca cases globally, 270,000 deaths. This is the Worldometer dashboard. And as we go down, what I like about it is uh, it gives us some critical information, we're down a bit more, on uh, uh, both uh, mortality and, and tests. So uh, the countries are ranked here by the uh, total number of cases, um, but there's a, lot, a, lot, a big problem with data. It, we're just so dependent on what countries actually uh, report. Um, we seem to have the IGN team come in there. Um, and what I find useful about this one is um, when you go over to the, uh, the right-hand side, uh, deaths per million population and tests per million population. And uh, we see uh, Spain and Italy there have done an awful lot of testing. They're quite uh, advanced epidemics. Um, US and UK are quite similar. They've done lower levels of testing per million population. I'm using 30,000 per million population as a cutoff. Um, and then as we go down, we see uh, Germany. Just there, Brazil, Turkey, Iran. Just look at those ones there. Now, Brazil, uh, 1,597 tests per, uh, uh, per, per million. Uh, and as we go down a little bit further, we're going to see Belgium, Portugal, and then uh, Ireland. Um, Ireland must be just below Sweden there. Yeah, there we are. Now, uh, the, the, if we go into the next slide, we'll see kind of a categorization of countries. And you can always go back and just look at that data. Um, actually, we don't see it, but I'll tell you what it is. Um, we've gone into, uh, I think, what might help explain the different epidemics. The UK and, and the US, uh, a lack of leadership, uh, a kind of a populist approach. 
uh, really delayed in terms of responses to the epidemic. Whereas I would say Portugal is a real exemplar uh, and uh, Germany and Ireland also. We're doing a lot of testing and we're doing better than some of the other countries. The ones we saw there that are particularly worrying were Iran, uh, Brazil and Turkey. And again, we're seeing either populist or quite demagogic, uh, demagogic type uh, leadership. Uh, what else is important in terms of the epidemic? There's been quite a bit lately on, on epidemiology, which has really come to the fore, as science is important. The third is health workforce and protecting your health workforce. But public health, like epidemiology, has really come to the fore. And where it has a, a dominant role, the, the, the response is, um, uh, is a good one. Uh, we saw in the US how Fauci and, and um, the scientists are, are, are being sort of um, pushed down by populist leaderships. Um, good data is, is essential or else you end up counting the dead. And data interpretation is difficult um, because we're so reliant on countries to, to test and to, to report. At the bottom there, um, I think what we really need to be paying attention to is the, the poor, the displaced and ethnic minorities who are hit hardest by the virus, uh, hit hardest by the responses, uh, especially the lockdowns, and uh, we need to better understand their vulnerabilities. So next slide. Um, these reports came out, uh, oh, what do we know that works? So it really comes down to the, the, the coughing, sneezing etiquette, etiquette, the good hygiene, the physical distancing, the detection and isolation, contact tracing and self-isolation, uh, and oxygen helps. And everything else is question marks against it. I'm sorry if the slide is kind of hidden at the bottom, it is uh, for me. Question marks about closures, about lockdowns, do lockdowns actually, uh, are they worse for the population? Um, and I think this question is still there, particularly in low income countries and question marks around face masks. People just really need to pay attention to the top two there. Next slide. Now these reports, um, the reports came out particularly from uh, Imperial College over a week ago. I only got to read it yesterday and I'm really excited by them. I haven't read the Stop TB one, um, but uh, Imperial deals with the three diseases. And this is the first time that we've actually had sort of data, it's modeling data showing the potential, quantifying the potential impact on the three priority diseases. And with HIV and AIDS and tuberculosis, these impacts are going to be over a five year period. It's through to interruption of antiretroviral treatment, delays in diagnosis and treatment of TB, maybe a higher mortality, and the impact on malaria to interrupting bed net campaigns is going to be a lot more immediate in the first year, year and a half. And, and the magnitude of the impact is of the same order of magnitude. It's actually less than the potential impact of COVID directly. Um, the next uh, slides are going to show, um, now th these are the three reports, so you, can, you have the links there. I, I really look mainly at the first one, and we're just going to have a taster uh, over the next three slides. So here is uh, what, this is the first time that I've actually seen the impact of COVID itself uh, on low and middle income countries being modeled. And look at the dates there. This is what's really worrying. Um, now it's a model, it's not based on data that have actually uh, 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 you know, occurred as yet, but we're looking at a very rapid scale up of deaths, perhaps in July, within, within the space of three or four weeks from uh, nothing up to 6,000 deaths uh, per, per million. Um, now, this is much higher death rates than um, WHO have talked about recently. In a population of 100 million like Ethiopia, you, you know, you're, you're talking about potentially 600,000 deaths directly from uh, COVID. The other thing, and you can't really see it here, for some reason or other, the, uh, the, the, the legend for the lines have fallen off, but they are the different control measures. And you'll see it when the slides are, 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 um, are, are shown. Uh, next slide. Yeah, so some, somehow the legends have fallen off. We get them back up there again. Here you, you have uh, two, two different. Um, the first brand there is if you have no, no um, distancing, no interventions. There you can see them actually. Uh, 
The second one, and I think this is what we're seeing in Africa at the moment, suppression lift. It's a really imperial, do very good work. You know, locked down for three weeks, four weeks, but you don't do anything else. And then you end up with that second brown line, similar levels of mortality as if you had done nothing at all. Whereas the green line there suggests you have some ongoing um, suppression or you have a very effective suppression at the bottom, which is what uh, you know, China has achieved and uh, but very few countries have. So that's the impact on healthcare capacity. And the third slide there is, is specifically the impact on HIV. And here they've taken South Africa as, a, as an exa example and shown the death rates um, from HIV per, per million per month, going from 120 up to 180, uh, maybe in January 21, 22, and then falling down gradually over time. So what's really good about uh, the, these reports is that they model the impact of COVID directly on populations and the additional impact from uh, the three diseases, the, the treatments, the interventions, the preventive services being interrupted. So a bit longer, I'm sorry, Nadine, but it's re really good information there, I think. Yeah, thank you, Rory. That really is um, really interesting information. And like you say, it's the first time that we're starting to see that kind of information. So, um, so thank you for that. And I think it's, um, and just to say to anyone, if you have any questions or you know anything you want to, any questions you want to ask, use the Q and A button down at the bottom of your screen, and we'll do our best to answer those questions or direct them to the panelists. So I think it's good that today we're kind of taking on that theme. We're, we're kind of talking about uh, research and evidence and, and how does that relate to humanitarian responses. So I'd like to go over to you, Niall, if I can first, and maybe ask you, you know, what are some of the knowledge and the evidence gaps in, in, in the humanitarian response that, 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 that we need to be thinking about in relation to COVID? Okay, thank you, uh, Nadine. Uh, I think one of the reasons I'm here this week is to is because I'm involved in running the public health module within the Masters in Humanitarian Action. And I think humanitarian action, I suppose we define a crisis or a disaster as a situation where people can't cope. And the Centre for the Research and the, the Epidemiology of Disasters in Louvain University in Belgium talk about more than 10 dead, 100 affected, and a declaration of an emergency. So that's how we define a, 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 an emergency or humanitarian crisis. Uh, and I'm looking at this from a public health uh, lens. So I'm looking specifically at the disease itself and not some of the other, other issues that we, are, we have been discussing in previous weeks. Uh, but I also want to suggest that when we're talking about humanitarian action here, it's very difficult to separate humanitarian response from the rest of what we do within what we call the humanitarian development nexus. I think it's extremely difficult to, to differentiate. So this is applicable to all contexts, not just the acute phase of a humanitarian response, which is what we're in at the moment. It also includes uh, preventing a disaster, preparing for disaster, minimizing the risk, and also early recovery. What we do in early recovery also is important as well. And if we view climate change as an emergency, and that hasn't gone away, then we're all working on a humanitarian footing. Uh, I want to start off by talking about public health priorities, because the first thing that we do in UCD on the Masters in Humanitarian Action is we talk about humanitarian priorities, public health priorities in humanitarian context. And we utilize MSF's list of 10, which is developed in a book called Refugee Health in 1997. It's been added to since with other issues such as mental health and psychosocial support, protection and security have been included as well. But in the original list of 10, there are seven technical priorities and they include WASH, they include shelter, they include food and nutrition and they include vaccination also as well. But the other, true, other three are non-technical are what I refer to as kind of management related functions. Now, I'm not a researcher, so I'm not going to talk about the research agenda. I'm talking about maybe kind of the evidence gap and the knowledge gap. And I'm going to talk about the, these three kind of key public health priorities. The first one is assessment or context analysis. And I have to suggest that maybe we are perhaps not identifying the risks and prioritizing what our responses should be, not just in relation to COVID-19, but what we do in terms of public health and humanitarian context in, in many crisis situations. The second one is human resources and training. Uh, do we have the right staff to respond to this kind of pandemic? Um, uh, and, and do we have the right quality of staff? Do we have the right numbers of staff? And obviously at the moment we have difficulties in terms of uh, storage capacity and not being able to arrive uh, on the ground. And then the third issue I'd re I referred to is the issue of coordination. Uh, how well are the sectors or the clusters connected together? 
And I was looking at some of the stuff coming out from the Global Wash Cluster last week, uh, and I found it a bit confusing. And I felt I found it also not terribly well connected to some of the other clusters, particularly the health cluster. And just as, as it happens, I just mentioned that next week I'm speaking at a learning event on shelter and health. And the shelter cluster, I think, have recognized that they need to incorporate health more into their shelter responses. And they've been doing this prior to, to COVID-19. And I think that's a really welcome development that the clusters are now kind of working more closely together and to incorporate public health into their shelter response. Because I think public health, and more specifically environmental health, my area is an area that should be mainstreamed into all aspects of humanitarian action. Um, what event is next week? So what are the knowledge and evidence gaps? Um, I want to step back a little bit from COVID-19 specifically and highlight some issues I believe are inherent in most, if not all, humanitarian st stakeholders, be they implementing NGOs, UN agencies or donors. And I'm going to suggest some people might have been thinking that I might have been talking here about refugee camps and vulnerable groups and displaced persons camps, but I'm not. I'm going to talk about kind of what I think are inherent biases within the humanitarian system. Uh, the first one I want to talk about is a biomedical bias. I think this is not just applicable to humanitarian action, but there is a bio biomedical bias. And I saw this in relation to work I did in 2017 when I was reviewing the work of the Global Task Force on cholera control. And in my opinion, the overwhelming emphasis was on oral cholera vaccine and not on WASH in order to prevent and control the disease. I can also refer to TB, which uh, Rory mentioned there earlier on. I actually did my master's thesis on TB in 1997 when it was declared a global emergency when there were more than 3 million deaths at the time. Uh, and the overwhelming emphasis within the DOTS, within the WHO strategy at the time was on DOTS, directly observed treatment short course, and treating disease as a way to eliminate it. But there was actually very little, as I could see, on behaviours such as coughing etiquette, which is now very much in vogue, and, and better housing. Yeah, to avoid the overcrowding and to allow that physical distancing or social distancing that we see as so, being so important in relation to COVID-19 and also improved uh, ventilation. And I can also talk about experiences in relation to the trachoma as well, which I've been looking at more recently myself. So that's one bias, is a biomedical bias. I think we have to be really, really careful about the community focus of prevention and not focusing overly on, on, on healthcare centres. Second one I want to mention is, is a communal disease bias. Yeah, I know we're talking about a communal disease here, but if you look at the different versions of the Sphere Handbook, 2004, 2011, 2018, I've been around that long, uh, there's an overwhelming bias towards communal disease. Yeah, measles, malaria, acute respiratory infections, and diarrhea are the ones that are often mentioned. And even within that, there's a bias towards measles, malaria, and diarrhea. WHO indicate that more than 50% of deaths due to pneumonia amongst children, and let's not forget that pneumonia within ARIs is the biggest killer of children under the age of five outside of the neonatal period. 50% of those deaths are caused by particulate matter inhaled from household air pollution. Now, many of you know that I'm interested in household air pollution. And yet in relation to ARIs, the biggest killer of children under five, we do very little in relation to humanitarian action, in humanitarian action to address that. And maybe Ellen, if you could put up a slide there for me, which kind of illustrates the bias that I'm trying to discuss. This picture was taken in a place called Niaragusu, which is a refugee camp in Tanzania. I was there on a monitoring mission with Irish Aid uh, two years ago. Burundian refugees are there for four years. Congolese refugees are there for 20 years. We're not in the acute phase of the disaster, so communal disease risk should be relatively low. A lot of emphasis on tippy taps for hand washing, as you can see on the left hand side. I visited this woman uh, in a shelter with very little ventilation. She was cooking cassava leaves indoors because she had very little food. She had six children. One was a two week old born infant and the room was full of smoke and they're inhaling at least 13, at least 13 times guideline values for, for particulate matter in that environment. And yet there was no response. There was a, an initial primary response on uh, liquid petroleum gas, but that pilot project ended because there was no funding. And yet this is one of the biggest risk factors on the planet. And if you think about that in relation to COVID-19, of course, there, are, there is evidence that people who have an impaired lung function are more susceptible to COVID-19. So I think this is an issue we could be looking at a bit more. Mm. Uh, in relation to non-communal diseases, globally, 73% of the global disease burden is from non-communal diseases. Many people don't, I think, realize that. So heart disease, cancers, diabetes, hypertension. Why are these important in low and middle income countries? Yeah, yes, maybe the community disease burden is highest, but actually the NCD burden is actually very significant, even in low and middle income countries. Mm. And we know from the data in Ireland just the other day in relation to ICU admissions, 
uh, people had a combination of morbidities, chronic heart disease, chronic respiratory disease, and diabetes. So I think when we think about vulnerability and defining what vulnerability means in humanitarian action, we need to be thinking about non-communal diseases as well. And Niall, can I just ask you, um, I mean, there's so yeah. much information there and just, to, you know, and I know Ben is going to pick up a little bit, a little bit later on some of the evidence issues, which, which is going to be really important to, to, to hear that. But I mean, I know you said you didn't want to focus on research, but if you were to say like, the, you know, top three research priorities that you think we need to be focusing on in, relate, you know, in the context of humanitarian and development responses, what would they be? Yeah, well, I, 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 well, I think in terms of vulnerability, I think we need to be looking at household air pollution and how that is contributing to vulnerability in relation to uh, COVID-19. One of the other issues I wanted to talk about here, but I know you want to, you'll want to move on, is the issue of tobacco. And again, this is from a gender perspective as well, because there are about 5 million deaths per year from tobacco every year. It's going to increase to about 8 million deaths per year by 2030. 1.5 million of those deaths are in women. 3.5 million of those deaths are in men. Now, there is some suggestion that there's a protective effect from smoking in Northern Italy, but <laughs> I would be very interested to see if, if smokers are more vulnerable to COVID-19 than non-smokers. Uh, and that's one of the other issues I would like to, 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 to look at. So it's, a, it's around vulnerability and vulnerability associated with non-communal diseases and then, then some of those key risk factors that I just mentioned. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Niall. That's wonderful. And we might try and come circulate, you know, circle back around to you as, as we move on. But for now, I'm going to move over to, uh, to Golwali in Pakistan and just ask you, can you just give us a, you know, talk to us a little bit about the current situation in Pakistan and maybe even just give us a, an overview of, of how, what, what the humanitarian response to COVID is, is, is like at the moment? <coughs> Uh, thank you for giving us this opportunity. It's, uh, it's now very well understood that uh, COVID-19 is not only a health emergency, but it's like a systematic uh, risk with this cascading impact. Uh, in Pakistan, the first case was being registered on the 26th of February uh, with only two cases. Uh, it was one in the south, another was in Islamabad. We have border with China and Iran, China being the epicenter for this uh, disease, and Iran, again, there was an exponential increase in numbers uh, for the last couple of months now, uh, and we have both uh, trade and travel agreements with these countries. If I see the, the numbers in Pakistan today, uh, the figure is uh, over 25,000 are confirmed cases, with close to 600 uh, people are dead, which is 2.34% uh, of them. There are 29% of these people are already being recovered. Uh, and Pakistani government are now accelerating their testing capacity close to 10,000, uh, over 10,000 per day. Uh, and as soon as these uh, uh, tests are being conducted, more people are being uh, declared as positive. Uh, this pandemic almost uh, spread all over Pakistan, uh, with 60% of them are locally transmitted. If I give you a gender disaggregated data of the people who are being uh, affected, uh, interestingly, 77% uh, of them are male and 25% of them are female affected. Uh, if you look at the age bracket, uh, the age, the people who are being affected, if you see it from the uh, age from 10 years to 49 years, 51% uh, of them are male and only 15% of them are female. Uh, so uh, almost two thirds of them are the people affected with this age bracket 10 to 49. About 50 years is 33%, uh, which is 6% are male and only 7% of, of them are female. Uh, this spread uh, this uh, virus is being spread all over Pakistan, but mainly the concentrated area are urban uh, and the urban slums. Uh, it's maybe because of the congestion, the lack of public health facilities, uh, wash facilities there. Uh, the government of Pakistan has very good uh, and categorical response on containment. Uh, but the scale and the scope of this crisis required extraordinary efforts. Uh, and that's also include to engage the civil society organization by the government uh, as a catalyst for behavior change. Uh, there was the expectation that by 25th of April, um, 
there will be over 50,000 people would be uh, registered as positive cases uh, uh, and over 10,000 will be uh, dying. But uh, these numbers did not happen by 26th or 25th of April, there was only 13,000. So the government is now, this number is being shooting up, but the government is doing this uh, smart lockdown and now easing up this lockdown because of the economical hardship to the people there. If we see the, uh, the response, the humanitarian response in Pakistan so far, uh, because of the, uh, the nature of this disaster where you do not have access to the community for fear of spread, uh, uh, and it is, has extraordinary challenges. Uh, the civil society organization are collaborating with the government of Pakistan and they are reaching out, helping the government to reaching out to the community, distributing uh, some food compliance, complying with this book, uh, with all the, the, this, the, uh, uh, the parameters uh, being set out by the uh, health department. Uh, and guidelines given by the World Health Organization. Uh, NGOs are basically collecting their own uh, resources locally, and they are distributing foods also from their own resources. Uh, government is basically unclear to engage uh, uh, the, uh, the CSOs in this response because the CSO has the grassroots linkages and network with the community, but at this stage, government is still uh, not very clear and they don't have very clear strategy. Uh, <clears throat> government of Pakistan has actually uh, initiated a cash emergency cash program uh, called a SAS cash program and they are covering or targeting 1.2 million people uh, with this program giving them $75 through uh, through online registration and then giving them uh, that resources uh, through a system called Easy Pesa. They also initiated uh, another program, which is called a SAS uh, Emergency Food Ration Program, but it's not yet been initiated. And these are basically for the people who are being stuck during the lockdown. Uh, they have lost their jobs, and uh, you know uh, they are being the most vulnerable right now. Uh, Prepared has uh, my organization and some other organization. We have experienced, for example, if I can give you an example uh, of the KP1 of the province in the north, uh, it's entirely different. The mortality rate here is too high comparing to other part of the country. Uh, well, there are still not that many, but uh, every day the number are coming in. Uh, we also do work in, uh, for the arid zone in the south of the country called Tharparka district as the arid zone. And there, interestingly, there are not many uh, cases being registered as a positive because uh, they, they live, uh, their, their traditional living is they live in the hearts away from each other. Uh, they are the extremely poor people, but uh, majority of them are daily wage worker and then in form, working in informal sector in the big cities like Karachi and Hyderabad, the mega cities. Due to this lockdown, they came back and their families are being stuck and whatever they had, they have lost uh, the jobs and they have finished all their assets and they are now depleting their assets. Their main asset was the livestock and they were selling livestock just to survive. So now is the question of survival for them is they are dying due to hunger and the malnutrition is um, so high, not before, uh, even the, 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 the pre-COVID, there were many children are being died because of malnutrition. So that area has a different sort of uh, disaster uh, being affected, not specifically with the COVID, but their impact is too much on the and the nutrition and uh, food security. And, and Gulwali, just as you're, as you're speaking there, I mean, I was also talking about some of the gaps in knowledge and evidence that we need to be able to respond effectively. What would you say are the, are the critical gaps that you're already finding that you think we really need to respond to in order to, to, to make sure this response is as good as it can well, be? Well, yeah, I, I think it's maybe globally, but in Pakistan particularly, is the knowledge gap is the the time frame. Nobody knows when this uh, disaster will ha will end, and unless and until you don't see the end of this disaster, because nobody knows that when this uh, vaccine will be there and the people will be restarting their activities. 
So uh, there is a growing fear, you know, of losing jobs and livelihoods and, uh, you know, the, 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 pa the payments and uh, all those, those stuff. So one is there is no clear cut knowledge or research being done that when this will happen. So it affect, it, it affect not only our planning and budgeting, but even for the government, because the government is, what they have been doing, they, they said is they, they diverted most of the resources to the COVID-19 response. Uh, and those projects, like if I give you an example in the, the, um, the arid zone, where was livelihood project are being stopped, it is being affected now. So one is that knowledge, and then the real time assessment and the contextual analysis is not being done uh, by the government. Uh, recently, uh, IECRC, IRC has done a very small size, a simple size uh, assessment being carried out, and they have very interesting, uh, you know, the, the the findings. Though the sample size was very very small, but it affects the whole segment of you know the the, the clusters. So the other gap is to me is the uh, the assessment is being not being carried out and uh, UN. I asked, I put this question the other day in the UN general coordination meeting and they were not clear when they can do it because unless and until they have the seal, the UN seal on their assessment, the donor doesn't, you know, accept that uh, happily. The other one is like the definition of the vulnerability is changed now uh, and the stack would be changed because initially there was a different definition for vulnerability, but now look at the, 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 the people uh, in Pakistan like or 50 million people already living below poverty line. And there is an estimate that because of these, uh, the deadlock and this uh, lockdown and the loss of job and the closure of businesses, it would be double. So, so and people would come down below poverty line in Pakistan. And there is an estimate that I think is uh, this, uh, the, 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 our strength, uh, the CSOs, uh, the strength is the network and all those, but the sudden, uh, you know, the, uh, the curtail on effort to respond, uh, uh, was the, the funding gap. There was no funding and the international organization has cut their funding. Yeah. So a lot of the CSOs have laid off their staff. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Our organization, were organization, and we were, basically the frontline worker and we lost the job and many, many, many staff are being laid up. So yeah, uh, the well, other I mean, one is like you, stigma. Um, stigma. Yeah. I mean, you're raising issues. Okay. We, we have been um, really grateful to hear to hear that perspective. And I think you're talking about issues of, um, you know, issues around funding. I heard stigma there and also just vulnerability, the same theme that, that, that Niall was talking about. So thank you for, for sharing that perspective with us. And if you can just hold there, we're going to move across to another speaker and then hopefully we can come back around to hear from you um, before the end again. Um, so I think moving along, um, Amy, if we could perhaps just um, just come to you, I think you're, you know, you're coming in with a different hat on. You're kind of you're coming in with education as a humanitarian response. So what are the kind of um, effects that, that you guys in Concern Worldwide are already seeing in the programs as a result of um, COVID-19 on some of your education uh, programs there? Yeah, thanks. I think it's fantastic that we're opening up this conversation to look at the impacts beyond just the health sector. Um, particularly the education sector, obviously, um, which is often overlooked in humanitarian responses in general. Uh, at the moment, there are 177 countries with nationwide school closures, um, and only five of the countries uh, that uh, have schools open and the rest have sort of localised school closures. That's 1.6 billion children that were previously in schools or out of schools at the moment. 91.3% of school going children. And then that's on top of the estimated 260 million children that were out of schools prior to the COVID-19 crisis due to poverty, humanitarian crisis, conflict and exclusion. So essentially we're seeing in education a massive increase in the scale of the humanitarian needs around education. And although school closures are obviously necessary in, for the public health and safety, the impacts of, uh, on children, caregivers, teachers, communities, and education systems in general is, has potential to be really devastating, particularly in the world's poorest and most fragile countries 
where resources for distance learning solutions are really limited. Um, so we know that there's likely to be a significant negative impact on learning outcomes uh, with school closures and with the inability to access online learning options, particularly where we already see significant learning crisis, where we might have very low adult literacy um, levels and also availability of any sort of resources. And we know that education is a key factor in addressing a lot of health indicators, child and maternal mortality and nutrition, stunting, uh, livelihoods indicators, gender equality, conflict, it, it's all very interrelated. So if we don't act to address some of the gaps in the learning needs, we're going to be seeing those rippling effects for generations. Um, and Amy, what, what's concern doing about these? I mean, these issues you raise are so, um, so important and we even, you know, we're experiencing, experiencing them here in Ireland with all of our children at home and, but with access to uh, varying degrees of, of access to, to online, uh, online op opportunities. So what is Concern Worldwide doing in terms of the emergency response? Yeah, so our response looks at um, access to education, the quality of the education and also the well-being of children, because we know that along with the learning needs, there's also a lot of the child protection issues that where schools would normally be a protective environment for children. So we're working to um, develop continued learning opportunities that are accessible to the poorest and most vulnerable. Um, radio learning is one of the key uh, resources that we have because it, we're able to reach many children with minimal devices and accessibility of devices is hopefully a bit higher than it would be for other um, technologies. We're also looking at how we can uh, engage with community learning, caregiver engagement, um, and really leveraging what uh, systems might be available and might be able to be used. We're making sure that as well that along with the basic learning side of things, we're integrating the life-saving health messaging. So including the child-friendly uh, hygiene and importance of that, as well as sexual reproductive health, because we know that that's also a, a big risk to children at this stage. Um, and making sure that the social emotional learning and psychosocial support aspects are integrated into our programs as well. And alongside that, looking to the future and looking at how we can make sure that there are plans in place to safely and inclusively reopen schools um, to make sure that we're sort of bridging that gap between the Im immediate response needs and also the protracted crisis and development needs that will be ongoing as well. Mm. And in relation to those needs and what you're dealing with now, I mean, just as I asked the others, what are some of the knowledge gaps and the evidence gaps that you're, you already are, are seeing as you, as you are supporting uh, partners to respond? Yeah, I mean, I think in education and emergencies, there's a, a gap in general. Uh, there's very, very limited evidence, particularly robust evidence of um, what works and what is effective. Um, but as Niall mentioned, they're really understanding the, the real contextual impacts of the crisis is key. Um, I think there's quite a bit of information floating around in terms of quite uh, high resource context as to what the impacts are but really understanding what um, children and how children and families' lives have been impacted and what their priorities and needs are. We obviously can use assumptions from previous responses, but this is quite different. Um, I you think then- You've been involved in, in say Ebola, you know, you've been involved in Ebola in Sierra Leone. I mean, what have you learned from, from responses there that could be directly or indirectly applied? Um, you know, and I know you're, you know, you're thinking of education as a humanitarian response and development response, yeah. Yeah, so um, during Ebola, we did see um, some interesting things come through. There's unfortunately, again, quite limited, uh, robust evidence available, but some of the sort of, I suppose, quick and dirty evidence that we have um, show some really interesting things. Uh, actually, in Sierra Leone, we saw uh, increases in learning outcomes during the school closures um, where children had access to continued learning opportunities and uh, accelerated learning once schools went back. And we saw the, the opposite happening in, uh, say, Liberia, where there was less of an education response. So we don't have uh, anything really robust enough to really make generalizations, but it would be really interesting and useful to understand more about how that works. And then the other one would be around um, early pregnancy. A lot of the, I suppose, the most commonly cited education-related evidence from Ebola is around the increases in early pregnancy due to school closures. 
some of that's uh, a bit tricky because there was very limited data prior to the school closures as to uh, the sort of prevalence and the uh, instances of early pregnancy, but we know it's very, very common. And we do know that there are spikes in um, the, the protection risks and the abuse and violence against girls and women. Um, so again, it would be really interesting to build on some of that learning uh, to really understand wh what are the protective factors that schools might be able to, to have in place, but also how we can take some of that learning to, to recreate those protective factors when we don't have what we would normally use as our sort of base, I suppose. Amy, thank you. Huge amount of food for thought. And I love that we have education and health here um, here together as we're as we're looking at the, the response to COVID. So thank you for that. Um, I think I'll just move over to Ben, um, if I may, and uh, not an easy job, Ben. Also with the title of evidence aid, our expectations could be very high when we're talking about evidence. Um, maybe you could just tell us a little bit first about the work of evidence aid. What are you doing during this pandemic? And, and maybe just a little bit about uh, what you're what you're seeing. Sure. Uh, well, first of all, thank you. It's a real pleasure to be here. And Evidence Aid and the Irish Global uh, Health Network have really strong connections. Uh, as you know, many of you on the call will be uh, very aware of our work because you are our work. You, you help write our summaries and you, um, you support us in lots of different ways. Um, for those of you who don't know, um, Evidence Aid really has one, one job, uh, which is to try and get high quality research um, into use in disasters and emergencies. That is our purpose why we're here. We don't produce novel research. Uh, we think there are lots of people out there who are doing that. Uh, it's a well-funded enterprise uh, in many ways. Um, uh, but instead we concentrate on putting together existing research uh, and summarising it and getting it out into the public domain and making sure it's being it's useful and it's usable and it's used by decision makers. Um, in relation to the COVID-19 Outbreak in particular, our focus has really been around collating, initially at least, collating all the evidence that we can find, uh, which is relevant to the treatment and management of COVID-19. Um, uh, and to date, we've summarised around 200 uh, systematic and rapid reviews and published these on, on the website. And we've promoted these also directly to decision makers uh, in LMIC, so our, that's our focus. Um, working with partners like uh, Global Health Network and uh, the WHO and uh, the Irish um, uh, Health Service Executive and various other people to try and get that evidence out into, yeah, out into the public domain. And Ben, I know it's, a, it's an impossible question to ask you, but I mean, what are you seeing based on the work that you're doing? You're kind of at an overview level, really, with your hands on, on all of the information about what we already know, what research has already told us. So what are some of the knowledge and the evidence gaps that you could highlight for us, particularly for the humanitarian actors who are, you know, trying to respond as best they can? Right. I mean, the first thing I'd, I'd say is that we, Evidence Aid doesn't do sort of systematic gap mapping. We, we, there are others doing that. I'm, I'd, um, uh, there's a really great living, uh, living evidence map um, from the health perspective, not the humanitarian perspective, uh, done by the Epicenter. Uh, there's another one that the um, Norwegian Institute of Public Health has done, uh, which is very good. However, I think, um, uh, I mean, I, I, you know, almost before we get on to evidence map, evidence gaps, I would say, you know, it's about, it is about understanding what we already know. And actually one of the biggest gaps is understanding what we know. Um, and that's one of the reasons why we do what we do um, is that um, understanding what the base, what the existing evidence base is that's applicable in, to COVID, and what the quality of that evidence is, uh, what therefore the robustness of um, uh, evidence around particularly effectiveness of particular interventions is going to be, uh, is really important. Um, I think there's always an implicit assumption that more research is needed, and obviously more research is needed in certain areas. Um, but actually there's a huge amount of relevant information out there already that can potentially inform research. The problem is a lot of it, it's, it's inaccessible and it's not always pretty clear what the policy is. Um, in relation to humanitarian assistance, though, I, I, I guess I'd pick out sort of three, three areas that I think might be particularly relevant and urgent at the moment. I think there's not particularly strong, I think um, where we were talking about this earlier, I mean, the, the understanding of comorbidities uh, with common uh, common conditions found in low resource and humanitarian settings is 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 uh, is a big issue. Uh, 
um, we need to understand, you know, obviously in the rich world, there's lots of focus on risk factors around age and around non-communicable diseases and how those are, are impact on risk uh, and, and mortality in our own societies. But if you take a country like, I don't know, Somalia, uh, where the median age is 18, um, uh, those aren't necessarily, go they aren't necessarily going to have the same risk factors, although obviously there'll be big overlaps. Um, but, you know, in high density, um, poor urban environments where you have large displaced populations, you know, as, as, um, as Niall was saying, you know, what are the, what are the risk factors around chronic respiratory diseases? What's the relationship with malaria? What's the relationship with tuberculosis? Um, how about sort of chronic uh, uh, diarrheal disease and just nutritional status, actually um, understanding that link is really important. Um, secondly, I think it's around, you know, and again, now I think sort of touched on this, it's around understanding how you can change hygiene behaviours, both at a global level, so we know a certain amount about that, but it's also contextual, it's understanding that contextual analysis and triangulating the global evidence base and what your local research and your local data is telling you. Um, and so, you know, what, what can social science and science together tell you about for example, where you have a, you know, a, a, a cultural context where business is done through physical touch, it's through, you know, shaking hands and continuing to shake hands until you've done a deal, you're a man. How do you, you know, what's the impact of that on transmission and how can you address, how can you rapidly act to try and challenge some of those behaviours and um, mitigate or offer alternatives and what sort of things are effective in terms of change. And I think thirdly, I think it is about those long-term impacts of COVID-19. So again, in, if you take somewhere like Somalia, where such a high proportion is a, a quarter of the gross national income in Somalia is, is from remittances, which are likely to have completely collapsed, you know, you, you've pretty much wiped out a portion of the, what's going to be the impact on public services, on the health system, on the, on the food security, on all sorts of areas, and, and on education what are going to be those long term so I think that's a, those are we need we need to kind of start to understand from previous outbreaks what the impact was and also start to map what the impacts are right now. And then, I mean, just, just asking you about the previous impacts and also just reminding people, if you have any questions that you'd like to ask the panellists, please just type them in the Q&A box and we'll do our best to, um, to direct them. Um, but Ben, you talked about, um, you know, just learning from previous, um, you know, previous responses. And I think that's one of the things that we're all trying to do is, you know, what, what do we need to know? And I think your, your point about, um, you know, knowing what we need to understand, I think, is, is really, really key. But what, what have, you know, have you already come across, you know, important lessons? lessons from other, um, you know, health crises and education, you know, with education as well, that could help us where we are now in terms of evidence? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I would say this, wouldn't I? But I, I think understanding and valuing evidence is really critical. And if you look at, um, I mean, the last major outbreak, um, sort of uh, infectious disease outbreak, I was really involved with it in anything like a frontline role was the 2014-15 the Ebola outbreak in West Africa. Um, and it's, it's acknowledged, I think, a lot of lesson learning from that has, has acknowledged that the early response was kind of an evidence-free zone. We were operating in a bit of a, a vacuum right at the beginning, and that led to some, that was one of the contributing factors that led to the slow uh, and perhaps not very coordinated kind of early response to Ebola in 2014-15. We didn't have, as a humanitarian sector, I don't think we had the skills or the understanding to, to, to understand the existing evidence base um, and bring that into play early in. And I don't think we had the capacities early on to understand the contextual data or to try and start producing the good quality data that we really needed to inform the response. But I think understanding um, you know, the critical role of, of research and evidence um, early on in particularly in infectious disease outbreaks is really really important you know later on people like msf and, the, and their episode did a great job of pulling together a lot of that information but it, you know it it was um you know we could have done a lot we we could have been better prepared i think that's the key thing um i think you know just picking up on what nar was saying there as well about the implicit bias within you know, within the humanitarian sector, sometimes to look for evidence which reinforces what you already do. Um, and, 
you know, trying or maybe, you know, we, we do have that kind of confirmation bias, if you like, which right, we, we kind of pre-select evidence which, which uh, reinforces um, our existing interventions rather than actually going, you know, so a WASH organisation, uh, you know, just to challenge Niall a bit, I guess a WASH organisation will tend to say, to look for answers to the question, how effective is WASH? Uh, rather than saying, well, what can we do to reduce the risk of the key diseases which are killing people, whether they're NCDs or, or communicable diseases. Um, you know, during the Ebola response, again, you know, I think, I think a lot of organisations tied themselves in knots trying to figure out how they could do their pre-existing interventions rather than go, going, okay, what does the evidence tell us about how we can best add value here? Uh, yeah, so so you're kind of you're asking us to it's almost like you know it, be objective as objective as we can and as open as we can to to see what the solutions really could be and also what we already know i think that's i'm hearing that uh, from you very clearly yeah and I, I think i think the other thing i'd say is you know it's about thinking to the you know trying to think to the future and the post response and what happens next and i think seeing evidence as part of pulling back better. So we tend to see evidence in the humanitarian sector in quite instrumental terms. So how do we improve our interventions right now? Um, and I think evidence needs to be seen as part of resilience. So, you know, a, a good, a resilient country, a resilient system, a resilient health system is to have evidence and data at the heart of decision making. Um, and we you know we as a humanitarian sector produce an awful lot of information and produce a huge amount of data and we tend to view that as ours and we take it with us when we leave um, actually trying to invest that evidence in the context where we work um, in and finding partners to work with who can then use that evidence to inform future responses where we may not necessarily be present I think that's really important so seeing evidence as part of us Yeah, thank you for that, Ben. Um, a lot of food for thought as well. And I think it would just be good if I can, you know, we're, we're going to be running out of time very soon, but I'd love just to come around to each of the panellists and just ask for a final word based on, on what you've heard in terms of the kind of breadth of the discussion. And uh, what would you leave us with, you know, those of us involved in, you know, trying to um, trying to figure out what's the best approach, uh, how, we, how can we best support, where is the information, what would your, your you know, your advice to, to us be? So maybe, uh, Niall, I'll start with you and just ask you for a brief comment thanks okay apologies there i seem to drop out for about 10 minutes so i'm sorry i missed the end of amy and the beginning of ben uh, i i would stress again the kind of three public health priorities that i mentioned at the very beginning uh, linked to what ben was just saying there now about doing an assessment you can't make a good decision without good data that's really really important and you can't make gather good data unless you know what it, what data it is you have to gather if you, from a gender perspective, you don't know that household air pollution has a, a major impact on women and children in particular, and an impact on acute respiratory infections, which is one of the biggest killers of children under five outside of COVID-19, you need the right people in order to do that. So you gotta know what you don't know. And the other, the other thing then, because this is a public health response, we need to coordinate across all clusters, including the education cluster, shelter, health, nutrition, wash, and education, all need to be working together cohesively to address this issue, but also use this as an opportunity to build upon the forgotten foundations of health. Like WASH is one of the forgotten foundations of health. Education is probably a forgotten foundation of health. Let's use this to build on the forgotten foundations of health and use it to have an impact in a sustainable manner. Thank you, Niall. Um, wise words. Thank you for that. Um, Amy, maybe I'll come over to yourself and just ask again, if you could just leave us with, um, you know, just some key kind of key, key points or key things to, for us to take with us as we move, move along. Yeah. Well, I think Niall said it really well just then, um, really looking at what the, what the other parts are of this problem, that it's not a puzzle that only has the pieces that we can initially uh, assume that we would be playing with, that there are many hidden pieces and to really be looking at the, the broader scope of this and looking at not only the, the traditional sectors or the traditional clusters that we would be working with, but how they all interrelate with each other and also some of the intricacies within them. Uh, the issue around uh, gender and around some of the dynamics that we see bringing in conflict into that as well and how that's also uh, exacerbating and uh, increasing some of our, our challenges to really look at 
how these things are working together and working against each other to make sure that we're looking at the bigger picture, really. Mm, thank you, Amy. Um, thank you for all of you today. We really are getting a look at the bigger picture. And uh, maybe over to you, Golwali. Just uh, if you've got some final words for for us, how, what would you uh, what would you give us in terms of advice moving forward? Well, thank you. I uh, personally, being a humanitarian practitioner for many many years, I have been here in this global village. And today, I I see it's it's really this pandemic has brought us. Uh, together at the, at the global village uh, pandemic, it's affect everybody. So what I would suggest that since it is a global pandemic, uh, there would be a lot of collaboration and uh, coordination among the countries and among the nations for sharing the data and sharing the information and research, because it is more uh, logical and more uh, contextualized, but again, it will be very helpful. Uh, second is, uh, I, I would see being a humanitarian practitioner and a local organization to educate how to educate donors uh, to see their perspective and how they can change their perceptions uh, and, and looking at like, you know, uh, implementing in the real sense this uh, localization agenda in the real spirit for the people uh, or the, uh, especially for the developing countries. Mm -hmm. uh, and integration and cross-cutting of, as uh, uh, Niall said about now you can't do a uh, program in isolation. Uh, so everything has to be integrated in cross-cutting, uh, whether it's a, a nutrition or it's a health, it's education, it's uh, yeah. everything is to be integrated in cross-cutting. Thank you, Gulwali. Really, really appreciate you being with us today. Thank you for that. Uh, and maybe Ben, just to you then for a final word. And I think we've put up in the comments, you can link the, the website, Evidence Aid a website is there. So you go, please go and find the information that you, you need in order to have the evidence and to know what you don't know, as Niall said. So Ben, just a last, any last words for us? Sure. Um, I mean, you know, I think most of what I would have said uh, uh, has already been said, so I won't repeat it. Um, uh, I think, uh, but just to kind of, you know, uh, um, you know, I think the um, the, the point around uh, um, uh, intersexual coordination and and looking, you know, from a research perspective, looking across social and social science uh, research, and we need a kind of integrated uh, model. People not to be working in their in their boxes and their silos. I think that's really important. I think uh, the other point I'd say though is, you know, it is looking to the future. What happens the next time? This happens, um, and, and you know this. This may circle round again. This may be with us for a while, but even if it isn't, um, how do we prepare better for um, future infectious disease outbreaks and make sure that uh, we some of the, we've left, we've learned some of these key lessons, uh, and we've made we've, we've kind of put um, uh, uh, knowledge and evidence uh, right at the heart of uh, future responses. Yeah, well, thank you, Ben. Um, thank you. Thank you, everybody, particularly thanks to DSAI and the Humanitarian Working Group of DSAI and Katrina O'Dowd and all there who really uh, brought this uh, brought this webinar to life. So thank you for that. And I know we've put an evaluation in the, the chat box. There's an evaluation link. Please help us to evaluate as we're online now for all of our events. Uh, please just take a moment and that would be really helpful. And Hala, back to you. Okay, uh, so thank you Nadine and thank you to our speakers for these really interesting perspectives and points for us. We hope to see you again in our coming webinars. Also again, thank you for DSA Ireland for collaborating with us and we hope also to collaborate together in the future. And uh, the next webinar will be about balancing human rights and competing priorities in global in the global COVID-19 response. So if you have any questions, please send this uh, to our uh, uh, emails. And uh, thanks to, to our attendees for joining us. And the recording of the webinar will be available in our YouTube channels and the websites and also in our newsletters uh, that was shown on the screen. And don't forget also to check our COVID-19 portal with the best and most updated information on global health. Thanks again, everyone, and see you next week. Stay safe. Bye, everybody. Bye. 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 Thanks very much.